Welcome to a fresh edition of This Week in Wisconsin Prep Hockey. This is Bill Berg with my audition to be the host of Wisconsin Prep Hockey after Mike Trzinski tried and Bill Berg Jr. tried. Still no sign of MJ Hammett, our normal host. Uh, there have been rumors that he's been spotted in the Janesville area, but no confirmation. Uh, if anybody happens to see a hobbit-like creature roaming around in the Janesville area, please let us know or send him back to Wisconsin Prep Hockey. In the meantime, we will carry on without him. Uh, we have Michael Trzinski in Wisconsin Rapids, Del Scanlon in Reedsburg, and Bill Berg Jr. just down the road in Weston. Let's get started today with our games of the week. Trasher got to go to KB Willett Ice Arena in Stevens Point to see Northland Pines take on the Spash Panthers. How did that game go, Trasher? That game went pretty well. Um, in a way, I was kind of surprised, but then again, um, the Eagles of Northland Pines pulled out a 3-2 to two victory over the Spash Panthers, and all indications were that Spash was favored a little bit in that game, but Pines really played very well and pulled out a one-goal victory in that game. The Spash Panthers scored the first two goals in the first period. Nick Norgren and Trey Zagzipski scored to give them a 2 to nothing lead. Brady Snedden scored on the power play in the second for Eagle River, Northam Pines, to tie or to cut the lead to 2-1. to one. And then the third period was all Pines. Snedden scored in the middle of the period, and Gunnar Schiffman scored with about five minutes left for the final tally, 3-2. to two. Shots in the game were pretty even. Uh, Pines led 32-28 to 28 in the game. Um, you know, I mean, you think that, that Spash had a, a lot of uh, carryover from the previous year and stuff and that they were going to be really, really, really strong and blow Pines away in this game, but... Pines came out and played very tough, and I think, according to uh, one of the announcers for, uh, I don't know, the radio station up there, he was with Chris Altman, and he said that he thought that was the first time in 12 or 14 years that Pines had won a game at the KB Willett. So uh, Pines looked really good. Spash looked good, too. It was a, a pretty close battle between two even teams as, as it turned out. But the, the visiting team, Northam Pines, took a 3-2 to two victory in our game of the week. And with that, well, I will we can, turn... We, we, can, we can talk more about this game, can't we? Oh, sure, we can. Well, I, I, not this game. I was just going to, you know, you, you talked about Spash, you know, carryover from last year and stuff. We had a handful of players from Northland Pines stop by our booth down at the, the state tournament last year, and they spoke very confidently about what they were going to have and what they were going to do this year. Um, the, the, I, I don't think anybody up in, in Eagle River in the Northland Pines school is, is surprised uh, with this. They, 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 they were expecting this. They, they, they were very confident, the guys they had coming back, and what they're going to be able to do this year. So I've just kind of been waiting to see if, you know, they actually had, you know, the, the, the stuff to back it up. It, it, it appears that they do. Well, yeah, and I think the hard part for us is that we don't always hear the names from up there, but I can tell by looking at the roster, just last names, John... Millette, um, Savala, you know, guys like that, Sema, these are all, like, probably, they all have brothers and sisters that have played or are playing on this team or have played on the team. But, I mean, we don't really hear them, so you don't you don't know how good they are, I think. But, like, you look at, at Spash, for example, uh, Zegzebski, 
You've heard of him. He's a good player. Barrett Brooks, a good player. Dan Hoyard, Kobayaki. I mean, you hear these names and you go, okay, these guys are going to be good. The problem with Pines is that we don't always get to know the players, the names. Um, but I'll tell you what, on the ice, they definitely uh, they were as good as Spash, and on that night, a little bit better. So um, kind of tough to, to make the call. I mean, I can say it's kind of a, a surprise that they won, but like what you said and the the the, uh, the heritage or whatever you want to call it of Northam Pines, they can flat out play hockey, and maybe they're not the big names that you've always heard, but they get out there and they get it done, and uh, they beat Spash on the game that I saw. So well, I, I guess it just. I guess it just depends on where you live because the names that you mentioned from Northland Pines, I was familiar with those names and I really didn't know the names you mentioned from Spash. So yep. maybe because maybe because you're only, you know, 25 miles away from them, those names sound more familiar to you. But uh, the names from Northland Pines are, are names that I'm familiar with. I mean, there have been Sneddons up there forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Bra- Brady Snedden had two goals in that game. Gunnar Schiffman, I remember hearing him about him from last year. He he played very well. Um, but you know, Jack Rohde heard him. You know, he played a, a really good game too. Uh, and then, probably my favorite story from this game that I didn't even mention yet is goalie Brett Wilkins. And um, I've known his dad, Gene. For many years, Gene is the the Zamboni driver at the the Northam Pines rink. I think the the main guy, and he gets into it um, while he's uh, driving a Zamboni around, getting the fans all fired up and stuff. And I, I gotten to know him. He's a, a heck of a good guy. His kid played a really good game. He stopped twenty six to twenty eight in that game. So uh, that's another kind of a fun storyline for the the Pines. Uh, so. I think this team is going to be not sneaky good, but they're just going to be good because they are good. You know what I mean? So we can take the asterisks away from their name? I think we can. a good team? I think we can. All right. And as you mentioned earlier, I was in Eau Claire on Saturday for the girls' game of the week, the Bay Area Ice Bears uh, made the drive down Highway 29 over to Eau Claire. And it was senior day for the ECA Stars, and they were honoring their three seniors, Aaron Everson, Charlotte Akrovic, and Ava Keeson. And two of those players, Ava Keeson and Charlotte Akrovic, uh, scored the first two goals in a 3-1 to victory for the Eau Claire area. Um, not only did they score the two goals, they pretty much controlled the ice, uh, these two players. And had I been a better correspondent, I would tell you where Ava Keeson and Charlotte Akovic and Aaron Everson are going to, to college next year because they, they read all that off um, as they did their bios. Uh, Keeson and Akovic are going to be continuing playing hockey. Uh, I believe Keeson is going to a, 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 a school out east and Charlotte Akrovic is going to be a screaming eagle at Minnesota State. So that was uh, brought up during the game, but it was very, it was, it was a good game. Um, the Ice Bears, very disciplined, very well coached, uh, you know, held their positions well, moved the puck well, broke it out of the zone, didn't get a whole lot of pressure on, on the the, the Stars goalie, but overall, the, the ECA Stars were just faster, and eventually, it, it was only one one to nothing after two periods, but eventually that, that speed uh, caught up to the, the the Bay Area Ice Bears, and the, 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 the Stars pretty much controlled the third period, and it come, came out with a, a three-to-one win. Um, in that game. And the, the thing that was surprised me about that a little bit that the, at the three to one is that with 40 seconds left, there was an icing by the stars and the 
face off down in their end, 40 seconds left, you're down two to one. And it, it seemed like the Bay Area coaches were satisfied, you know, that, hey, three to one is better than we expected. We'll just leave it at that because they did not pull their goalie for an extra attacker to try and, you know, pump a goal in or try to, you know, get things happening at, at the end of the game there. They just settled for the, the three to one loss. Hey, Burglar, do you think that high school coaches have a little cheat sheet like the NFL coaches do when it comes to uh, going for two um, in a game uh, as opposed to uh, when to pull your goalie if it's two goals down? Because I saw that, too. I saw it in a game where it were, there were like two minutes left. The team was two two goals down, and they didn't take the net minder out. It's like... Maybe some, you know, it's like in the movie Miracle where the Russian team is down and there was a position that they really had never been in before. And the, the, the Russian coach, the guy with the pretty funky eyebrows, he didn't, well, I mean, I'm sure he knew what to do, but he had never really come across that situation before. You think it's something like that? I don't think they have a... a I mean, the, the, I don't think they have a cheat sheet like to do. Yeah, in this situation, you do this. Um, I mean, certain coaches may have their own, you know, preferences, and you know, we've all kind of raised our eyebrows, you know, at at coaches who've you know pulled their goalie with four minutes left in a game because they're down by two or three. Um, I just thought it was unusual that you know, they didn't they didn't try uh, to to. I mean, I, I was you. you until the horn sounds, you you try to win the game, whether you think you're going to or not. You play to try to win the game. Yeah, I mean, not to say that the coach didn't try to to win the game, but you know, I, maybe, I wonder sometimes. Oh, go ahead. Maybe the coach read that thing you wrote last year about how pulling the goalie is not worth it, even though your sample size was incredibly small and not really valid. So it's, so it's Trasher's fault. <laughs> that could well be. Oh, and by the way, could speaking be. of it's Trasher's fault, we have a new email new email address. If you want to send hate mail, Trasher has a different email service provider now, so you're going to have to send it to a new email address. Yeah, just go oh, on the web, go on the website, and uh, check out the contact info, and uh, send me the the hate mail or the love mail or the whatever kind of mail. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to switch gears here, just. Break away from hockey just for a second because this reminds me of some mindless thing that happened at the end of that uh, football game yesterday where the Packers were down by 10 points. They had to score twice. They had to get a touchdown and a field goal. There's only third down, but that's 16 seconds. You're not going to win anyway. But with 16 seconds left, they're at the 30-yard line, the Bears' 30-yard line, and they kick a field goal, and the guys announcing it think, well, there's not. Well, they need a touchdown and a field goal anyway. You know, kick the field goal now, get the onside kick, and they get the touchdown. Well, you only got time for like maybe three plays total. You're at the 30. You kick the field goal. You get the onside kick. You're way back at your own 40. You got twice as far to go to get that touchdown. So what was the point of kicking that field goal? What was the point? We're not going to take it up now. I just wanted to get that out there. It was stupid. It was a pointless thing. Anyway, back to hockey. Um, well, speaking of, yeah, back to hockey, Trasher, you went to another game last week. <laughs> Burglar, I'm <laughs> laughing my ass off right now. I can't help it, man. Oh, where's Deshaun Kaiser when you need him, right? Maybe yeah. he'll play the last two games. Anyway, yes, I did. I went to uh, West Salem, Wisconsin, over by La Crosse on Alaska, and saw the West Salem Panthers open up their new rink, aptly called the Panther Den. It's right near their high school, um, and it's an Olympic-sized rink. It's a nice facility. They're going to have, eventually, um, permanent seating for about probably eight, 900 people, they said, and uh, 
the the complex is going to have softball fields outside, uh, not inside, outside. Uh, softball, soccer. There's gymnastic a gymnastic center inside that's going to be used for like training and practice and stuff. Uh, really nice facility. About the only downside I saw to it was they have these windows on the ends of the rink, and I think at some point. There's going to be a little sun shining in that's going to cause some difficulties. But other than that, um, a gorgeous facility. They did a heck of a job, and uh, looking forward to see what they end up with. But uh, So that was that was a first for me uh, to go to a new rink like that. And a- another first for us at Wisconsin Prep Hockey was this was the first game, the first time that we covered the Baldwin-Woodville Blackhawks. So couple of firsts in that game. Um, Baldwin Woodville came out and scored first in the about seven minutes into the first period to score to make it one to nothing. They scored two times in the middle of, of the second period in a span of about a minute and a half to make it three to nothing. Um, Coach Eric Borey for West Salem called a timeout, probably try to calm him down a little bit, time, try to kind of rest his team a little bit. And it worked. And a little bit later, they scored a goal to make it three to one. And unfortunately for the home squad, that's how it ended, three to one. Uh, Baldwin Woodville held a huge shot margin, 37 to 19 in the game. So they basically doubled up on the West Salem Panthers. Uh, so after playing one quote unquote home game at the Omni Center and five games on the road, the West Salem Panthers kind of were rudely greeted by their guests, the Blackhawks at uh, the Panther Den in a three to one loss. Um, I was very impressed with uh, the Baldwin Woodville goalie Zach Bishop he had 18 saves in the game only, but he made some nice saves and I should have looked. I didn't get a chance to check this out, but they had played um, on Alaska the night before, and I had heard rumors, and like I said, I didn't look it up. Maybe one of you guys can while I'm talking about this. He had 50-some-odd saves the night before in a 3-1 a to one loss to on Alaska. So uh, he looked really good out there. Um, also kind of looked like Jeremiah Johnson. He had the beard thing going on. And uh, but it was a it was a good game, uh, pretty close. On Alaska, or I should say, West Salem wasn't the the West Salem of days gone by with Gorniak and those guys on the team. But they, you know, they they f- fared well. Um, just took a, a, th- a three to one loss, and I'm sure uh, they're very happy to be in their their new arena now, guys. Uh, Zach Bishop had 43 saves in the 3-1 to loss to Onalaska. <laughs> okay, I was close. 43. Still not a bad game, though. He, he, so he no looked, more meat locker then, huh? No more meat locker. It's now the Panther den. So I'm, I'm sure that, you know, they, got, they have some work to do. They got to get their bleachers in. Uh I was in the locker rooms. The locker rooms are very spacious, and they got a couple, like, anti-room, an- anti, not anti, anti-rooms for, like, coaches and laundry and all of that kind of good stuff. But uh, I think a well-thought-out place, um, it's going to be a, a nice complex when it gets done. My only complaint was that it, it was kind of a bitch to find. It was, like... Mm, there was nothing that said where the Panther Den was. And then when I did finally find out where it was, it was like a, a gravel twisting, turning road to get to the place. So um, I think once they get it, you know, whipped into shape, it'll be a heck of a place to, to go to see a hockey game. And uh, otherwise, it's a pretty decent place. All righty then. Thank you for that. And moving on, next order of business is our Players of the Week. And Del Scanlon is going to break the news on who they are. Thanks, Burglar. 
our girls player of the week comes from just down the road from West Salem and plays for the Viroqua Blackhawks. As a junior goaltender, she had 49 saves in a 2 to nothing win over the Metro Lynx on December 15th. And uh, that was Viroqua's only game of the week. And our player of the week is Abigail Severson from Viroqua, a junior with, once again, posting 49 saves and a 2 to nothing win over the Metro Lynx. On the boys' side, we travel north up to Burglar's Old Stomping Grounds. And our junior forward from Antigo had three goals and a 5 to nothing win over Medford on the 11th. Then on the 14th, he had one goal and a 3-2 to two win over the Appleton United. And on the 15th, had one goal, two assists, and a 4 to nothing win over Fond du Lac. And the boys' player of the week is Isaac Wickersheim, a junior forward for Antigo. And with that, we're going to pass it on over to Webb Jr. for the top 10 this week. Thanks, Dell. Uh, we'll start with the girls this week on the top 10. The f- top five do not change. Uh, Eau Claire area, central Wisconsin, uh, the Warbird Co-op, western Wisconsin, and Fox Cities uh, make up your top five. The bottom five uh, changed a bit. Uh, St. Croix Valley Fusion is sixth, USM is seventh, Hudson is eighth, Cap City Cougars are ninth, and the Hayward Co-op is tenth. Honorable mention for the girls are the Rock County Fury and the Chippewa Falls Menominee Co-op. Uh, for the boys... Uh, nobody wants to hold on to that number one spot. Uh, Notre Dame ran into a brick wall named Garrett Larson and uh, lost their number one ranking from last week. Number one this week is Verona. Two is University School. Three is Superior. Four is Notre Dame Academy. Five is Sun Prairie. Six is on Alaska. Seven is Spash. Eight is Northland Pines. Nine is Wausau West. And ten is Nina Hortonville, Menasha. Honorable mention for the boys this week are Waukesha, Hudson, Fond du Lac Springs, Madison Edgewood, and Eau Claire Memorial. So a little shaking up there. Yeah, there's a lot of movement on the boys. The girls' side, not as much. Uh, obviously, the top five stayed exactly the same. Um, I'm surprised. Well, I'm not really surprised, but Sun Prairie, all the way up at number five. That's That's been a while. I'm not overly surprised by that, I think, because there were some... Um, newspaper articles prior to the season talking about Sun Prairie and how they thought, um, I don't know who they is exactly, but the pundits perhaps thought that the the Cardinals would be very strong this year and would be a a very solid challenger for a state tournament um, due to the fact that they had, I believe it was five all conference players returning, and I don't know if though I, I can't imagine those are all first team, but um, you know to have five of the better teams in your conference returning for a team has to to bode well, obviously. And you know whether the the five spot for Sun Prairie is a little bit of uh, overkill right now, or if it's accurate, I guess time will tell. But um, I think if you got all that talent on the team that, you know, it's going to rise to the top and it looks like the Cardinals are kind of heading in that direction, guys. Yeah, the next two weeks for Sun Prairie are at Arrowhead, at Onalaska Lacrosse, at Middleton, uh, at home versus Waukesha, and then at University School. Um, so between Onalaska Lacrosse, Waukesha, and University School, you've got three ranked opponents in there, and then Middleton and Arrowhead are not usually anything to stick, shake a stick at, so... Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good two weeks for them, and I guess yeah. After that, we'll we'll know pretty well who they are. And even in their their one loss to uh, to Verona, they actually outshot uh, Verona in that game almost two to one. On the on the girls' side, uh, Eau Claire not Eau Claire the the Bay Area has they, they, I think they dropped out of the top ten. An honorable mention last week, but. That, that's a pretty sound team, and I think they're going to make their way back into the top ten eventually this season. But one player I failed to mention was uh, Josie Bender, 
I believe she's a freshman for Bay Area, and they have her listed as a forward slash defense. I think most of the time she lined up on defense, but she takes off with the puck. That That's a name that you're going to hear more as this season goes on and in the next three years. Uh, she's a solid player uh, as a freshman. Good size, good speed, stick handling, total package. We'll be hearing more from, from Josie Bender down the road. You know, Burglar, while you're talking about the girls' side here a little bit, uh, our player of the week this week, you know, comes out of Viroqua. The last time we really talked about um, Viroqua was a few years ago when their uh, goaltender ended up winning the Jesse Vetter Award. Uh, I was just looking at their schedule and who they've played, and I actually see they're sitting one point behind in their conference standings for uh, first place. Rock County and Cap City Cougars are both sitting with a 2-0-1 records, while Baroque was sitting at 2-0-0 in conference play. And I go, this act, this Friday and Saturday will actually give us a good look as to exactly where Baroque stands and, and how they're going to com- compete for that conference this year. And if they are going to compete with the Fury or the, and the Cougars for that conference as they take on uh, the Cougars on Friday night, and then Saturday they host uh, the fury there at home and so you, we're going to get a little answer as to just where they're going to be standing with them and if you know if it's just a goal their goaltender having a great game or if they're going to be able to come up with the scoring to actually challenge for that conference this year all righty that'll uh be interesting to see what happens then we've got some good matches coming up then we've got uh, holiday tournaments coming up after that uh, next week no this week we have games of the week coming up this week on the girls side it'll just be tomorrow and just uh, down the street from me at the green heck field house where the eca stars are going to come in number one ranked eca stars are going to come in and take on the number two central wisconsin storm Undefeated Stars, uh, the Storm have only one loss on the year, and that was to the ECA Stars in a 6-5 to five overtime loss uh, at the end of November. And also it, that game, well, we know it'll be a well-officiated game because Wisconsin Prep Hockey's favorite high school official will be doing that game. Um, and it's not Chris McGurk. And who is that burglar? That would be Nicole Clays. And do you have any relationship with her? I know her parents. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Very good. We 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 like Nikki. She yeah, is an yeah. awesome official and a, a good person. Yes, I, I know her uncle too. Well, both uncles. Well, several uncles. Never mind. Do, um, yes. Do, Grand, do, you, Grand, have, Grand, do you happen Grand, to know her gra- grandpa? Grand, Granddaughter Nikki Clays will be doing that game. All right. So be there. Um, so, yeah, do not be yelling at the officials during that game. Um, uh, yeah, that'll be our, our, our girls' game of the week. Interesting matchup, number one versus number two. And Dell's going to tell us about the boys' game of the week. Yes, uh, we were just talking about Sun Prairie uh, during the top tens, and where they're currently ranked number five, well, they'll be traveling on to number six on Alaska for a 2 p.m. game at the Omni Center. And looking for a well-played game, we're looking at number five against number six. And C.J. Lass from on Alaska was our boys player of the week last week. And you know, so this should be a very good game and – Give us a good idea as to where both these teams stand. Sun Prairie's coming in there with the one loss that Trasher mentioned was to Verona earlier in the season. On Alaska has been holding off everybody and not got a blemish on that loss side yet this season. So we're looking forward to a good game Saturday afternoon. And with that, I'm going to toss it on back over to Burglar. All righty. Thanks, Del. And, uh, Trasher wants to take a few minutes to perhaps draw more 
conclusions than he should out of a relatively small sample size again, which is his favorite thing to do. Uh, tell us about tie games this year, Trasher. Well, before we <laughs> do that, before we do that, let's talk about what Dell had just said. Um, number five, Sun Prairie versus number six on Alaska. And we'll see how things really shake out. And I mean, to me, it seems like there's been a, a lot of movement. You have like, um, probably the top, you know, generally three, four teams that are pretty consistent. And then the the remainder of the top ten has been kind of flip-flopping around. So, yes, Dell, I think you are absolutely correct. We'll see how five Sun Prairie and six on Alaska, they kind of sort things out in this game. And um, regarding our final comments, uh, ties in games this year, I had, I think, I don't know if it was me or one of us had made mention of it a couple weeks ago in our podcast about how it seemed like there was a lot of tie games this year. And our buddy from Arrowhead, Jeff Roshan, who is a mathematical statistical genius when it comes to stuff like this, came up with some numbers and found that this year, and, and I think the number is before December 1st, if I'm not mistaken, that 8.5% of the games had ended in ties, which means one out of 11, every 11 games ended in a tie. And yes, that was only a sample size of 141 games, as Burglar had said. So there's probably going to be regression to mean during the rest of the season to get down to the average, which is 3.7. So um, basically this year, more than twice compared to the, the previous, I think, six years, there have been ties. Um, the previous average is like one out of every 26 games. This year, it's one out of every 11 games. And um, I think, you know, you guys can maybe talk about this a little bit. Um, as to why you think this might be happening. But uh, I think uh, that the, probably the reason is because the kids are more interested in playing Fortnite and they're not, you know, they don't want to play hockey. They, you know, oh, screw it, we got to get, let's just go play Fortnite. So um, that's my thought. Guys, help I, me out I, here. I, I think, I think. The actual quote from from Jeff Rashan was definitely definitely more ties. Yeah, I don't know. It's a weird thing because a lot of the ties that caught my attention were all non conference games, and many of them were even non sectional opponents. Um, which in that case, you know, if you're in a conference game, you might do that that thing in overtime that I hate where you kind of go into a shell and try not to lose more than you try to win. Um, and maybe even to a lesser extent and, you know, versus a sectional opponent. But a lot of these ties are non-conference, non-sectional opponents, like uh, non-sectional opponents, like Fond du Lac Springs and Notre Dame had a 2-2 tie. I mean, that they're, they're both in the same area, but they're not in the same section or conference. So I can't imagine that one of them was turtling in overtime there's no reason not to just go all out and try and get the W. Um, so I think it's it's probably just a fluke more than anything, but it, it is it is odd. Well, oh, I can uh, I can say from my standpoint is having to post the top tens. I hate seeing those ties. So stop tying. Go for the win. Stop being such wimps. Come on, let's go, guys. Go for two. Go for two, yeah. Screw that extra point. Kick, you know, run for the extra point. Pass, whatever. Come on. No Try more ties. To play with no goalies in overtime. No more ties. Four and four, no goalies. Come on, let's quit being such damn wimps. I'm sure I'll get hate mail. Trash your dog at charter.net. There, I said it. Okay, boys. You said the uh, the new rink in... in... West Salem was Olympic size, right? It is, yes. Oh, now that I'm skating again, I can't imagine that. That sounds horrible. That's way too much ice. 
Yeah, but keep in mind that those kids are 20 years younger than you are and practice every day and probably in the spring too or, you know, in the, in the summer. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, guys like you and your dad don't skate quite as much and aren't used to it. So uh, for them, it's probably not a huge change. Um, and I think... You know, in the long run for West Salem, it's probably going to be helpful because, you know, it's like D.C. Everest, right? The, the kids practice on that rink every day, and it's going to help them, you know, as far as playing against guys that played on, like, the NHL size rinks. So uh, probably a good move to, to install that size ice in there, and it's... It's a nice place, and I think it'll be very helpful for West Salem. Definitely an upgrade from the meat locker for sure. I don't know. That 13-foot ceiling had a certain charm. I, I don't know if that was 13. It might have only been 10. It was it was pretty close, but um, I know that I, t I talked to a couple of the parents that were – were standing up by me, and they said, "Yeah, this <laughs> this place rocks." So um, maybe they won't have quite the home ice advantage that they had at the meat locker, but be a lot warmer for the spectators. All righty then. Anything else, gentlemen? Get us your information on holiday tournaments. We've got a lot of them up now. Uh, we think we well, we, we think we have most of them. But um, take a look at our. We we have a, a, a boys tournament page and a girls tournament page. If you don't, if your team is playing in a tournament, you don't see it listed on there, and you have a copy of the schedule, send it our way uh, so we can get it listed on there. It's always a very interesting time during this, this Christmas break. You get a lot of teams playing, you know, across the state, uh, different regions, different areas, teams that normally, you know, only play each other this time of year. It'll really do a lot to kind of shake out the different regions and see what's what. And even I think some of the teams still go play in Minnesota for this, so. Uh, get us your tournament schedules if you haven't already. And if you don't see a schedule on the site, don't assume somebody else for your team or anybody else in the tournament is going to send us the schedule. If you don't see it, send it. Um, and, you know, it, it it never it never fails when holiday tournaments roll around. One will start that we don't have on the schedule, and someone will get mad at us because we're not clairvoyant. Um, there's what between the boys and girls there's 120 some odd hockey teams in the state we don't know where they're all going to be at any given moment um so if you don't see it on there send it don't assume someone else is going to and burglar or web junior thank you um i will put um the appropriate email address to send that to if you click on the top um, right underneath the scoreboard ribbon, it should say 2018 uh, Boys Holiday Tournaments and 2018 Girls Holiday Tournaments. Just click there, and I will have an email address that you can send those schedules to. And we thank you, and we appreciate it, and so will your fans, players, and parents. That being said, I think we've said enough. So uh, thank you for listening. And tune. I don't know if we're, well, I'm not sure when it'll come out next week with the holidays and that around, but thanks for listening to This Week in Wisconsin Prep Hockey. <laughs>